that should work. So what I'm going to do today is to close the SDP part. Um, I'll go back to also what we have done with the, this DAG and the inflation approach. Uh, at, at the very end, I spoke about optimization problems. So I'm going to do like a short uh, introduction to optimization problem, wrap up the SDP part, and then move to representation theory. What's the, um, why am I going to do this? Because I put representation theory in this, in this workshop because that's what enabled us to speed up the computation of those SDPs. Studying representation theory by itself is interesting, but I don't think you're going to apply it directly on research if you don't have like the other techniques uh, well, well, well studied. Um, anyway, this is all like an introduction to those techniques. My goal is that I give you like the overview, I give you the, the, the terminology, the way those concepts fit together, and then later you can go to the literature and, and deepen your knowledge of the, of the topic. Um, so I will start by speaking a little bit about convex optimization. And I think at the very first session, I ask who knows about linear programming SDP, and I, I have like very few hands. So I give you like a, a, a nice introduction to the topic. Uh, I would say don't hesitate to ask questions and to reward people who ask questions. I, have, I bought Swiss chocolates. So they, they have suffered a little bit from the transit because they, they have been on like four flights already. Uh, my only worry is that the room is a little bit too cold. Normally you should enjoy them at like 25 to 30 degrees, they really melt. Um, so yeah, that's going to be the, the trick. Uh, let's go back to convex optimization. Uh, I think I said at the first lecture that linear programming was invented at the same time in the States uh, and at the same time in Soviet Union. And in Soviet Union, it was really to uh, rule the, the, plan, the plan economy. So you had to compute like what's the best way to produce this and that, and you had to, to basically model your systems. Um, what I'm going to give here is like the general form of a, of a linear program, then we'll move to SDP. And for linear program, I'm going to show you all these inflation techniques maps uh, directly. So uh, a canonical optimization program would be that I'm maximizing some objective. Let me think if I'm in the... Yes, that's... C transpose X. So basically, I have a variable X that's um, a vector of real numbers. I'm maximizing a linear combination of those X. And I have a few constraints on X. The first one is that all the elements of X are non-negative. And the second constraint is that X is the solution of a linear system. And it turns out that a lot of things that you want to express that are linear, you can, you can put that in that form. Uh, to give you an example, if you have, for example, uh, some x2, you want to write that it's greater than minus 1. So what you can do is to introduce a new variable, x3, that would be, let me check. Um, so we want to shift this bound to 0. That would be x2 plus 1. And then you say that x3 itself is greater or equal than 0. So there are a lot of tricks that you can play such that you're not restricted to this exact form of constraint, but you can, by introducing additional variables, you can uh, formulate this. I'm going to erase this part. You don't need to remember that. Why? Because there are toolboxes in MATLAB that do this reformulation for you. The one that we're going to use is called YALMIP because it's a bit easier to set up. Um, there is another one, it's called CVX. Please use version two and not version three. Three is too much in beta. Uh, what they do is they enable you to write things in a very natural language, and they will tell you, uh, maybe, okay, uh, sorry, like you put a quality constraint, I can't, it's not a linear program, but if you do things correctly, they will work and they solve your, your problem. So that's a, that's a linear program. Um, what's really cool with linear program, I don't know if any of you played video games, but a long time ago, like I'm, I'm 35, so I'm 36. So I play like, for example, uh, Warcraft 2, and I remember like if, if you had a forest that has this shape and you had your soldiers over there and you told them to go there, which is kind of an optimization problem, like move in that direction. Like we say here, maximize the, the overlap with that vector. And what they would do is get stuck over here and don't move, and they would not be clever enough to go around. Uh, and why is that? It's because the shape, the f here the feasible set, like the set where you, you can move, is not convex. Convex is basically a property, a set is convex, 
This is not convex, I need to be careful. If one of our points you take inside the set, the line segment between the two is inside as well. The property of convex problems, so I'm going to remove this, this was just really straight. Convex problem, if you solve them by just going as far away as possible in the direction that you want to optimize, and when you bump into a wall, basically you follow the wall, if you use this strategy, you always go to the maximal solution. And there is only one unique global maximum. You don't get stuck when you optimize, for example, of a function like this. You would say, oh, I think I'm at, I'm at like a maximum, but actually you're not at the global maximum. So convex problem, they don't have these uh, difficulties. So they are really efficient and robust to solve on a computer. So now, why did I put L uh, linear programs on that board? Uh, what was it? Was it one or two sessions ago? It was two sessions, well, well, like between the end of the first session and the beginning of the, of the second one. Um, we looked at uh, this inflation technique. And in the end, we, we wrote a, a set of constraints, and I'm going to like, compact them in some form. We had the distribution P inflation, and we took several marginals. So this matrix M here is what is going to compute the P inflation AB, the P inflation BC, the P inflation AC, that were the thing that we use in the, in the constraints. And then right hand side of this was a polynomial function of the thing I wanted to test. So here I had like the P test, A, B, and, and a few other things. And I had also like P, A test, like some, some kind of tensor product, P, C test, because I use a product distribution. Don't, don't worry about the tensor product. It's just to say that we, we made a product of two small things to build P, A, C. Um, so now I'm, I'm basically compacting this in this form. That's kind of the abstract form. And we impose a constraint that P inflation was positive. And now if you look at the form uh, that we have here, A, B, and C, they are, they are given. They represent the, the, the problem data. And in that formulation here, M, M basically tells you how to take the marginal distribution for PAB, PAC, PBC uh, from there. So it's going to be a matrix of zeros and ones. Uh, so this is data. It's, it's not going to, you don't optimize over this, you optimize over this variable. And this F of p-test, p-test, we know it. F is a polynomial in p-test. We can compute all these coefficients. Um, and p-inflation is basically the variable F. The only thing that we don't have compared to the canonical form of a linear program is an objective. So what we do is we just cheat and we say that we maximize basically zero, the, the vector of all zeros times p inflation. The, the good thing about putting that fake objective is that you can use things like duality in linear programming to get, um, so it's something that I'm not going to speak about, but like our goal was to prove that this is impossible. So you would put, put that in the computer and it would tell you that problem is infeasible, which is actually a, a good result for us because it proves incompatibility with the model, the causal model that we test. Um, and that's something I encourage you to read. So the dual of, uh, of LP gives you a certificate, which is basically something, if, it's, if, if it has few non-zero coefficients, something you can check by hand and that gives you an inequality that's kind of a bell inequality for your problem. So a test that you can reuse for other p-tests. It's a bit outside the scope of this workshop to, to give you an introduction to that. The, pa the inflation paper uh, 1609, something that I mentioned, has, like, it's a 46 page paper, but if you get into it, it's, it's incredibly detailed, you will not be lost. So for example, they give you that matrix M explicitly, they give you a few examples explicitly, so, so for self-study, it's, it's going to be a good thing. That would wrap up the, the inflation part. I don't know if there are questions about like LPs, because I'm going to move to SDPs, what, or they generalize this. If there are no questions, then um, for what I want to say is that for a long time, people use the linear programs to do incredibly many things including they would use approximation to solve business problems. 
problem in portfolio optimization in finance and so on. So uh, the good thing as academics is that we can get the codes from IBM or from uh, smaller companies like Mosaic or Groovy and say, hey, you in academia, use our stuff for free. We don't need to pay for it. Why? Because banks and, and, and other industries, they pay millions to buy those solvers. So it means that when you do linear programming, you have really, really good codes to use your, your problem on. And it's no big deal to optimize over millions of variables. Like it's something you can do on a laptop. No, no problem. Uh, but of course, people doing research, they say, okay, maybe LP is not the end of the story. Can we optimize over more things? So they added uh, a condition. If you, for example, if you say the norm of some vector, so that's a vector in Rn, is bounded by another variable in your optimization problem, that constraint is also convex. I'm not going to prove it. But it's something that's very easy to check uh, and compute with. So that's another class of problem that's slightly more general. And then what interests us is a, a class that's even more general. It's semi-definite programs. And basically, semi-definite programs, they enable you to write constraints of the following form. Um, pa, 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 pa. So you have your, your vector x. And then what you define is a big X. And you do a sum. And you do a sum. I goes from 1 to n of some basis of matrices times your coefficient x. So that's, that defines implicitly a new variable in your problem. And the condition that you impose is that the eigenvalues of that matrix are always non-negative. And one way to say that is that for all v in R, so that's going to be Rm, because x, let's say, is m by m. And last condition, all these matrix are symmetric. That's not an optimization problem. And oh, sorry, I forgot. You would still maximize something like uh, B transpose x. So this problem now is also a convex problem. And with this, you can do a lot of, of new things. You can compute norms. You can, uh, what can you do with SDPs? You can encode. A lot of problems with that maximize, minimize eigenvalues. You can use SDPs to, to handle them. Uh, and in particular, we, we can encode polynomial optimization problem, at least computing upper bounds of that. Um, again, solver will expect like a particular form. Uh, they will expect that you provide the matrices C, A, uh, the vector B. We don't want to do that. Instead, again, we are going to use modeling toolboxes like YALMIP or CDX2. So that's the, uh, I'm nearing the end of, my, of this introduction. The last thing I want to say is that SDPs, they start now to be important in optimization. And even like more general classes of things, uh, there is a company called Mosaic that's writing really, really good code to solve the, 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 those, those problems. Maybe just a word on that, a word on that. I said that you're going to use MATLAB and you're going to use YALMIP and CVX2 to write the problem using natural language. But YALMIP and CVX2, they don't solve your problem. What they do is that they take your mathematical formulation, transform it in a way that's understood by a solver. So you're going to go here with your problem, and then YALMIP and CVX2, they are going to the solver. So you need to pick one. For the lecture and the, for the lab later, we are going to use a solver that's called SD53. It's academic code. It's free, open source. You don't need to get a license. But I advise if you do like serious research, use Mosaic. You need to get a license, but if you have an academic address, uh, they will give you a license for free. And there are, of course, like other solvers. If you do linear programming, there are better solvers than Mosaic, maybe, for your, for your problem. There is a wide range of things. Um, but you, you don't need to care so much apart from installing it. Because when you use YAMI for CVX2, they will give the correct data to the solver, get the data from the solver and the form that the solver uses, and they will reformulate the solution such that it looks like the variable you defined. So, so it's, YAMI and CVX2 are incredibly uh, convenient for that. We'll do a little bit of that in the lab. Later, the lab will be half uh, pen and paper computation and half like a small introduction to this. Um, there are a lot of resources online if you, if you get deeper into that stuff. What I'm going to do now is to spend 
maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes on uh, closing the SDP um, polynomial yeah, uh, approximation of upper bounds so that we, we really get, get this uh, um, done. And then we move to representation theory. And then I'm going to link the two, why, why actually representation theory accelerates uh, SDPs. I think I will need to erase some stuff. I will start from the left, because this, this is just a summary of what we have seen in the first and second lecture. So I'll come back to the, the following uh, quantum optimization problem. I have uh, two devices that perform a measurement on a shared state. So you have a state here and here. I'm writing the state after it has been distributed by some source that transmits, let's say, for example, photons along optical uh, fibers. And then each of these boxes can uh, take a measurement setting. So it's like there is a switch on the box. You can decide like do first the first measurement or the second measurement. And then the box is going to reply with a bit as well. But I'm doing something slightly different from the formulation that I used at the, the last lecture. Now I'm assuming that the outputs are plus or minus one. So in quantum mechanics, um, of course now I, I will have two measurements, A0 and A1. It's, again, it's slightly different than the last lecture where I put the measurement setting on top and the outcome on the bottom. Now I'm putting both. Maybe I'll do something. I use a hat for those ones. And I'll put the settings on top so it's consistent with what I said before. Um, what I'm doing is I'm saying that this A at Z X, it's the A0 minus A1 that we have seen in a previous lecture. Oh, oh, small question. I realize this is very small font size. Can everybody see the even people across the room over there? Is that OK? Good. Um, so this is a convention that I'm using. I'm taking the, the difference of the two. So it means that my quantum measurement is now an operator A hat x with the following properties. Where do I use that? A hat x as, uh, so I'm just going to eigenvalues minus one and plus one. And again, uh, A at X, it's Hermitian. So if I take the, the complex, uh, uh, the conjugate transpose, I get the same, the, the same thing. And the same for Bob, so this is very similar. I define that B at X, it's B zero minus B one. This is done for convenience. Remember that when I define A0 and A1, uh, they, sum to, they sum to identity. So basically, if I had one, I could get the other. This removes part of the redundancy. Um, so we have these two measurement operators. We have a state still going to use the convention that it is new. And then if we want to, if we want to see uh, what we measure, we can get uh, a few things. So. What we are going to, going to measure, if I look at uh, A at, and I look at the result, so this gives me uh, the, the expectation value for the outcome A. So if this is plus one, it means that the box A always outputs uh, plus one. If I get minus one, very easy as well. Like the average of plus one and minus one is this like minus one of like a series of value. Um, it means it has always to be minus one. But now if I get something like zero, it means that it's a mixture of half the time plus one uh, mixed with half the time minus one. So it's like if I look at the list of measurement results, I would like plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, and, and, and so on. Uh, 
What happens now when I take products of this? Okay, second thing I can do is I, I check only what a B measures. And again, this is the expectation value or the average value of the, of the outcome B. One thing I didn't put, of course, that this expectation will depend on which measurement we, we do, so A, X, B, Y. But this only tells us like, what each box is doing in isolation. If now we want to recover what happens with, with both, we need just to take the product of these two operators. And this will tell us, so the product, the, the expectation value of the product of the signs. So if I get plus one, it means that A is equal to B always. Because the only way to do a plus one is to have either plus plus or minus minus. If I get minus one, it means that A is always different than B. Okay, now I'm getting too, too low for like this to be really readable. But if I get a zero here, it means that a equal B with probability one half, and A different than B with probability one half. Uh, P of A B is one half, and P of A different than B is one half as well. One thing that I'm go not going to do, but that you can verify, is that if I have two variables, two bits, A and B, basically here I get the expectation value of A, the expectation value of B, and I get uh, the expectation value of, of the scan of the XOR, you can actually recover P of AB, being 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Uh, so the encoding, like this true expectation value, is different than what we had uh, the other day. Uh, the other day, we had the expectation value of basically uh, A equals 0, B equals 0, like what's the probability of that? What's the probability of A equal 1, B equal 0? What's the probability of A equal 0, B equal 1? Those probabilities. The thing is, because those probabilities that we had the other day, they were defined using the operators A0, A1 without the hat. A hat is just a linear combination. We have the normalization condition. It's just a linear change to map those expectation values back to probabilities. I'm not going to do that now. It's, uh, we can discuss during the, one of the breaks if you, if you want to dig deeper. Because what I'm going to look at is that the CHSF expression now in the way it's presented usually. It's, it's using those plus and minus one uh, values. So okay, I need to erase now that bar. Which I will do. So. CHSH, I, the polynomial, is now A at 0, B at 0, plus A0, B1, plus A1, B0, minus A1, B1. So basically, we want to maximize when the measurement settings are either 0, 0, 0, 1. Uh, 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 Convention, this should be on top. I want to be consistent everywhere. I'm going to that usually I put them on the bottom so my all reflexes come back. Uh, when the settings are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 for x and y, I want a and b to be maximally correlated, to be the same. And when both settings are 1, 1, I want them to not be the same. So it, it kind of creates us some kind of frustration in the, in the problem, a bit like the Ising model on a triangle lattice, that you have no way to, to satisfy all the constraints. And that's what makes this, this inequality interesting. Um, now I'm going to list again, uh, I, I put some of these things over there, but I'm going to, to, to write down like what, what are the algebraic relation between those operators. The first thing is that if I have AX and BY, and, and B comes before A, I can as well rewrite that uh, by switching the order because they commute. 
because A and B are measurements on two different subsystems. The other thing that I have is that if I take the, um, the square of uh, A, and of course, what we mean is that those operators are emissions, so I don't need to, when I put squares, the same if I had like, this time it's uh, adjoint because uh, it's, it's and it's adjoint the same thing. Uh, this, what it is, because the eigenvalues are plus one or minus one. Um, and like when you do a measurement, I, I will get a result plus one, minus one. So I have no eigenvalue that are zero. So it means when I take the square of this, the minus one becomes plus one. So this becomes the identity. And actually, if I take also B and I square it, I get the identity as well. Do I have more things? I don't remember. Uh, is that all? Are these like all the rules? Yes, they are all the rules. It's actually a bit simpler than what I had written the other day, like with all these, these algebraic relations. Uh, by the way, when you have problems that you, correlation problems with binary outcomes, like with bits as outcomes, they are much, much, much nicer to solve than anything else. So please, if you have to choose which Bell inequality you study or whatever, like pick things with like bits as outputs. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, now what I'm going to, to look at is that at, at expectation value, what I will write is that if I have any polynomial f, where f is a polynomial in a at x, b y at. And I will say something is that uh, on those polynomials, I will introduce those things as equivalence relations. So basically, if I write, for example, a zero uh, times a zero, I have an equivalence relation, the same thing as, as basically one because of these rewrite rules. So it means that I, I will consider polynomial in non-commutative variables, but up to these rewriting rules. And one thing I want to say is that every time you have a polynomial, if you apply the rewrite rules in that direction, like specified by the arrow, you always come to some kind of minimal form, and you don't need to, 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 to worry about like which thing you rewrite first. You will always get the same result. Um, if you want more details about that, I can, I can tell you, but for, for quantum, it works uh, pretty nicely. You can just, just um, rewrite things using those rules. Now what I'm going to say is that we define the expectation value of a polynomial. Uh, it's just we take the, the expectation value with the, the state we are uh, testing, mu. This is very abstract, actually. Like it's a bunch of voters and so on. Um, just to be concrete, so let's say the state mu, it's a state in C2 tensor C2. So you've seen like in the previous lectures, like the quantum formalism, uh, it will be a vector actually up to a phase. So it's, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm saying it's a vector. Um, then the, the operators A and B, AX, BY, they will be basically matrices in uh, C4 um, times C4, because this is, this is actually C4. And any, uh, wait a minute, look, 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 yes. Uh, of course, that state needs to be normalized, so that's the only condition I need to add. Uh, so if, if I have this and, and, and matrices like that, that satisfy all the above, then it's a, it's a, correct, uh, it's a correct experiment that I could do in, in principle. So for example, if you want to, you go to a computer and you want to ask, okay, what's the maximal violation of this inequality? What's the maximal value? Given that I have a qubit and a qubit, what you do, you optimize, you write an optimization problem of uh, all the state in C4 and all matrices in C4 times 4 that respect those commutation rules and, and, and square to uh, identity and so on. And you will get uh, some, some maxima. But you have a two problem with that. So that's 
going to be now the our goal is to find the maximal uh, expectation value of CHSH over quantum. So now we have strategy one. Strategy one is fix the dimension D1, D2. Here we took like D1 and D2 uh, bit and uh, a qubit and a qubit. And then you optimize over uh, states and measurements. So actually, you have two problems with that. The first problem is that we have to fix the dimension. So as, as you will increase d1 and d2, and you don't know when to stop, um, like you will use more and more memory, and you have more and more parameters in your, your optimization problem. So that's the first uh, problem. The second problem, when you optimize over state and measurement, this is no not convex. So when you optimize, you don't know, you, you will never be able to prove that you've reached the global maximum, only a local one. So the approach that uh, some of squares try to solve, um, it's to give you an upper bound on everything you can do with those uh, operators and state that respect those relations. So this is now what I'm going to, to speak about. Um, small question, I, I'm like fully engaged with my material. I don't know how to compute the time because I don't know exactly when my session is supposed to end. Do you know exactly how, how much time I have remaining? How much? 40 minutes. 40 minutes. That's good. Okay. So now, sum of squares. So that's one name. Moment based relaxation. That's another name. Or again, the NPA hierarchy. I will tell you why, why those three, three names. Uh, there are way to put an upper bound on this problem. Sum of square moment-based relaxation is, is names that come from the optimization of our commuting polynomials. It's not exactly quantum. Quantum does not commute. But if you look at like examples that are maybe easier to handle than quantum, by using these two keywords, you will find a lot of tutorials on the web. The NPA hierarchy is the generalization of this to quantum non-commuting operators. And NPA is the name of the three authors, uh, Miguel Davasquez, Stefano Pironio, and Antonio Asin that developed the, the technique. So what do you do? So the idea is to replace the optimization over the operators and states to an optimization over expectation values. So the variables in the problem are now, it's, no, it's now going to be a y. Um, okay, here's the thing. Normally I should put a complex, uh, complex numbers, but for when you optimize over bed inequalities, there is a special trick you can use, and you can use real states and real measurements. I'm not going into the details, but I'm going to assume that it's real because it makes our life during, during the whole session much easier. So you, you're going to optimize of a, a vector y in R uh, n uh, monomials. And the variables are going to be, you know, the indices of y represent like monomials that are made of these operators. So I will have a y corresponding to one, I will have a y corresponding to a zero, which is the expectation of a zero, I will have a y corresponding to A1, and so on. Um, and I'm, I'm using here a basis of monomials. And this basis, for those operators, it's going to be 1, A0, A1, B0, B1, and then I start with the product, A0, A1. Why am I not putting A0, A0? Yes. So I'm not putting A0, A0 because I can immediately reduce it. Um, then I continue A0, uh, B0. I still have my old reflexes. A0, B1, 
So I think you, you understand the story that uh, possibly this is going to be infinite. So what I'm, what I'm going to introduce is a cutoff for the degree. I'm, I'm going to say that the degree of, of whatever polynomial I have in my system is bounded by 2D, which now cuts such that y is actually a, a vector with a finite number of coefficients. OK, now I have the problem that I'm exhausting the space on the board. Um, I will erase most of what's on this board because the commutation rules and the algebraic rules are there. I will keep this picture, but everything here is going to disappear. Uh, especially, but what's especially important to have in your notes is the relation between the hat and the operators we had before, that a hat is basically a0 minus a1 that, that we had the last session. So I'm going to erase that. Just put here that these operators depend on that. So now I have the I have those those monomials, I have those variables, and now I'm going to to um, express one constraint that's extremely powerful, and I'll show you what to do with it. So this constraint is going to be that if I take uh, any polynomial in my operators and I compute the expectation value of uh, its adjoint times itself, this is always non-negative. And last time I showed you why, because if you expand, then you can always um, write that as the like the inner product of some other st non-normalized state with itself, which is always non-negative. So now what I'm going to do is to expand that uh, polynomial f into a basis of monomials. So if I take now, uh, if f is of degree d, realize that this expression is going to be of degree 2d. So if I pound, put a bound that the degree of things in my system, they always are less than 2d, here I put a f, but that's that was before I put the product. If I if I want the whole thing to be less than two, then this only uh, will have degree one to respect the overall bound of, of degree two. So now I'm, I'm writing this just a linear combination. And this is a general form of a polynomial of degree one because I can't form any other monomial with like these four variables. So I'm, I'm all set. And now I want to write this condition, f dagger f, algorithmical dot zero. So I will proceed exactly as I had done uh, the other day. Um, I will use a scalar product. And I put my coefficient on the right. And here, like the those coefficients, because I assume real, they are real as well. So this is a vector in R5. So this is my f. And now if I write f dagger f, what is this? So like the, the, the dagger on the left one will permute the vectors. So I have this thing here. Now this takes an adjoint. I have a vector that uh, is now with us an adjoint. A indices on top. Check. This is multiplied by the thing on the right now, like that. D1 times gamma alpha zero alpha one beta zero beta one. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, one thing I forgot. Uh, this is f dagger f. Now I'm going to do a, two, a second layer of things. I'm going to compute the expectation value of that. It means that I have to compute the expectation value of that whole thing. But the thing is that those two vectors, they are scalars. Because like matrix multiplication is linear, then I just need to compute the expectation of the block in the middle. 
Um, just to say, what's, what's the thing here? Oh, wait a minute, and something is missing. This is missing. So what's this? It's a product of a column vector of, of operators with a uh, row vector. And if you, if you do, uh, wait, chuk, 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 column then the times row, yes. This gives you a matrix, like uh, row vector times column, column vector gives you a scalar. But if you do the reverse, you get a rank one matrix. Uh, and this is this matrix that we are going to compute. What I want to see here is that we wanted to say something about all polynomial f to give an expectation value that are non-negative. So it seemed that we had like infinitely many constraints to write because here I can pick five real numbers. The good thing is that now by writing the expectation value in this way, we extracted the part that's basically the moving, the moving part. What's in the middle is never going to change. It does not depend on the choice of, of polynomial. So this I can pre-compute, it's a matrix X. And now this is this matrix X that we are going to build. Um, I will need some space here. So just remember, this here was F, so that I can erase that one. So now I'm going to build this matrix. Remember, I'm, I'm creating it using this, these rows. Oh, sorry. Small observation. I'm going to add there. If I take the expectation value of some polynomial G, this is mu. The G mu. Um, but because everything is real, then I know that uh, this is going to be as well the same thing as if I transpose the whole, the whole thing. And it means this is equal to the transpose of this thing. So what this means is that what I have there is basically the transpose of what I have here, because I'm going to do the product of something with its transpose. So what it means is that I only need to consider the, the upper triangle, because the lower triangle can be deduced by symmetry of the matrix. I will fill this matrix with operators. Identity times identity. Okay. Identity times whatever is the whatever. So this goes super fast. Now, what do I have on the diagonal? A0, times A0, what is, what is it going to be? A1 times A1, identity, identity, identity. Um, what I'm going to have there, and I'm at the convention that's uh, da, 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 like rows come first, uh, yes. So I have A0, A1. Here I have uh, B0, B1. And here I have A0, A1, A0, A1, B0, B1, B0, B1. So basically, how does it work filling that matrix? You take the product of the operators, you apply any rewriting rule that, uh, that's relevant to, to reduce the form of the, of the polynomial, and then like to, to construct this matrix is the expectation value. So you, you, you say that this is the expectation value of, of all these things. So the first thing you can say is that expectation value of identity is one. Because if we have identity, we just get, uh, in that thing, we just get normalization. We have nothing in between. So the diagonal is one. The scalar one, not just the expectation of the operator identity. So now we have remaining coefficients in that matrix. Um, so we don't know exactly, we don't know what they are. But we can say they are just the variables that we have defined in our optimization problem. They're just scalars. 
And the second thing that we, we need to say, so no, no, those values are scalars, but they cannot be whatever scalars, because we know that that matrix X, if I multiply it by an arbitrary vector on both sides, I get something non-negative. So I know that this is non-negative, which I'm going to translate. I don't have much space. So I'm going to translate that into V dagger X, V, where this is V here, is non-negative. And this condition, if that holds for all V, yeah? yeah. Which one? Perfect. I think it's working. Is it working now? Okay. okay. Um, and this condition to say that the matrix S, whatever vector I multiply it with, is non negative at non negative eigenvalues, is the same thing as saying X is SDP. And that's the condition that corresponds to uh, some definite optimization problems. So now I have a way to constrain the, the expectation value of monomials when I have a quantum problem that with operators that respect those rules. So now to wrap everything together, what you do, you say, you declare your monom the, the, the optimization variable, so Y. You say they correspond to all the unique monomials you have in this matrix. How many of them do we have? Okay, this is one, it's going to, to be a scalar. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 variables. Then to form the CHS8 expression, what you're going to do is that, oh, A0, B0 is this one. A0, B1 is this one. A1, B0 is this one. A1, B1 is this one. So I want to optimize, to maximize this plus this plus this minus that, such that there are also other variables here and here, uh, such that this whole matrix is semi-positive uh, definite, uh, semi-definite positive. I uh, just want to check that the microphone is at the right eight. Yes, that's okay. And now you, will, you, you do this, you obtain a bound. Actually, for CHS8 that we will see in the lab, this bound is two square root of two. And then what you will have done is that if you optimize over qubits, you will find an explicit solution that gives you two square root of two. When you find it, so, so to wrap it up, you're going to, when you, when you use both methods, so strategy two here is the SDP method that we have seen. And what happens is this. When you optimize over state and measurement that are explicit, you have restriction in what you can express. So instead of exploring the full space of solution, you have a limited subspace. And maybe you're not exploring everything because it's not convex. So what happens here, let's say you optimize CHSH, with strategy one, you will maybe not get to the true value because you did not explore the, the solution that go higher. Now when you do sum of squares, you do something different. You don't construct an explicit model, but you start with like expression value that can be whatever, and you add more and more restriction on them. But the thing is, we have limited the restriction to a some degree. Here we are only use like degree one in the, in the list of monomials. So this is probably not enough to constrain your problem such that you get the true solution. So with SD, strategy two, SDP methods, you get a number that's higher. But note that's very good because you know that by construction, your true solution is going to be sandwiched in between. And you know how hard you have to work to bridge the gap. So maybe you have to bring this down, maybe you have to bring this up, and, and you'll see uh, if, you can, if you can make it such that you bridge the gap sufficiently so that you can say, I don't know, uh, the difference between the lower bound and the upper bound is 10 to the minus 6, so I'm satisfied I can finish a paper. Usually that's what people, people do. So that was all for SDPs. Now I will take questions. I don't care if we only do SDPs in that session and we move the representation thing to the lab. Uh, how much time remains? Twenty minutes. Twenty. Perfect. Perfect. Any question on all of this? If there are no question, I'm, I'm telling you the kind of stuff that you start to ask question when you do it, because what you have on the board is pretty is pretty abstract. Um, it's because of our lunch. Like, like, please ask me a question. If you say I'm completely lost, I did not get that, or there are, there are points that are not clear. Take a, a bit of time to digest. Um, 
What I envision for the lab is that I will give you some problems on the board. Um, I will also give you, so there will be a pen and paper problem on the board. There will be exercises that I will post online. I will write down the, the address. Uh, and then you do them at your own pace. And during the lab session, it's also the time to ask me questions about everything that we have. Now I'm going to move to our presentation theory. I'm going to erase most of what's on this board, what's on the board on the right, and I'm going to keep that matrix. Yes. Yeah. It's for two projects, isn't it? Yes. Can we extend it to three projects? Of course. Absolutely. So what you do, you just add uh, in the list of variables, not only A, X, B, Y, C, Z. You're going to have CZ that rewrites through identity if you have plus and minus one outcomes. And they will all commute. So basically, to find the canonical form of a monomial, you just order them Alice, Bob, Charlie. Done. And let me know that this C uh, does not violate the uh, American equality. Uh, GHS yes. They are like, uh, Can we get a condition for there? Like yes. Yeah. GHS is a state that works perfectly with those uh, techniques. So like uh, everything GZ like like work fantastically well here. When I say it works, is that you at degree one you get already the good solution. Um, let's discuss overland because there is a trick. You need to use. You, it will. There is only one trick. If you have three parties, you put A, B, C here, and you only consider degree one things. Mm -hmm. What you have inside is only degree two. Mm -hmm. uh, inequalities they will have three terms for Alice, Bob, and Charlie, mm -hmm. so it will not work. So you will need to put more stuff in the, in the monomial. Uh, so let me erase the stuff. And why, while I'm erasing, I'm going to tell you why uh, representation theory came into play. It came into play because we started to solve SDPs that were bigger and bigger until we needed to spend like, the, the price of a few airplane tickets to have like, a, a bigger computer to do computations. So most groups I know now have computers like 64. 128 gigabytes of RAM. Um, and then solutions started to take like months to solve, which start to be a problem. And it's fit, having like a problem that takes more than a day to solve is a big problem because you can't really iterate like science. You can check, oh, what if, and then you check, what if, and, if you, and, and you check. You need to be really like think about what you're doing, and then you wait for the months. And if, if, if you made a mistake or it was not interesting, you just waited, wasted like a month of computation. Um, so what I was thinking, most of the problems that we see, they have symmetries. And if we can use symmetries to reduce the size of the problem, then we win. I will give you a short uh, smell of, like, an uh, idea of why, why this is important there. So let's assume that the state mu and operators A X, B, Y, solution of CHSH over there. What I'm going to pretend is that now, if I permute A and B in the state, and I swap the list of operators, it's still a solution. Why? Because that inequality, if you look uh, closer, it's completely invariant under permutation of A and B. So now I can use that. The thing is, that's like, so that's here uh, on the second line, I'm going to have the permutation, and here I have the origin of solution. Let's say that this solution gives me a matrix X. So now, the second line is going to give me a matrix of, of expectation values where the rows of A and B have been permuted. So basically, it's like take this matrix, permute those rows and columns at the same time, and it's also a solution. But what I said about SDP is that they are convex. So it means that if these two things are a solution, then x plus, uh, not a, I'm thinking of something in my hands is doing something else. So this, which I'm going to call x average, is also a solution. So now let's write like the matrix that, that permutes this. So the matrix, matrix rho, what it does, it, it doesn't touch the first column, but then it's going to permute like the, 
the, the, the blocks A and B. So that's my role. What I have now is that this X, if, it, if it's a solution, if X is a solution, X permitted AB is a solution, X over line is a solution as well. But really has one thing. If this gives you a value of CHSH, this gives you another uh, value of CHSH, they are equal because this is symmetric. So now if I take the average of two solutions that give me the same value, this will not decrease my objective. So now this is something key. If X is an optimal solution, so that can be a proposition if you want, and I was not so formal in those talks, but that will be something formal. If X is a solution, then X is an optimal solution as well. So the, the kind of color right there is that we, we are going to add the constraint that uh, X comes from something like that. And what does this mean that X comes from something like that? It means that it's going to, X is going now to be invariant on the permutation of those blocks because I have done the average. So I add the constraint that X is rho X rho dagger. So the good thing is that that will reduce the number of variables in my problem. I'm not going to do that right now. We are going to explore that in the afternoon. But I have also other symmetries in that problem. So first symmetry we have seen. Okay, I'm using the, the bond on the right. Of CHSH. The first one is that I'm going to send to B0, B1, A0, A1. That's a legit permutation, and we have used that. A second one is going to be, I send A0, A1, B0, B1 to minus A0, minus A1, minus B0, minus B1. What does it mean? Uh, we have defined a variable such that they have like the measurement so that they have outcome plus and minus one, it just means permute the output of the, of the measurement for everybody. And of course, because all the monomials here have degree two, having a minus and a minus cancel, I get a plus. So B6% stays invariant. So this is the second symmetry in my system. And actually, I have a third one that I'm not going to, to detail so much. Is that I can actually permute just A0 and A1. So permute A0 and A1. This one is going to map to this one. They have the same sign. But if I permute A0 and A1 when there's a B1, I get a minus sign. So if I permute A, uh, A0 and A1 and there is a B1, I need to flip the sign of just B1, which is what I'm doing here. I need to put the hats everywhere. Okay, I'm skipping over the hats because there are too many of them. So, how do I know that I have, I have all the symmetries? The thing is, you need to take any permutation of variables and maybe uh, sign flips that respect the constraint that I have on my problem. So, I think I've erased that con those constraints, unfortunately, but I have that A0 and like A and B would commute. So, if you permute only one A and one B, but not block by block, you're going to destroy that constraint. Um, the fact that the square today is not going to be a problem. No, it's like the allowed symmetries are that I can do whatever flips I want. This is okay, it respects all the constraints. And if I permute the uh, one A with one B, the only thing I can do is to permit both blocks. I can just permit these two. That's fine. To explore all the, all the possibilities, there are not so many of them. And you see that's basically the group generated by that is going to give you the answer. No, I think I have something like 10 to 15 minutes remaining. Like what's the schedule? 23? So that's something. Not, so when do we end actually? 20, okay. So I don't need to rush so much. So this is like the flavor of what we are going to do. Um, Basically, you take this, this big matrix and you apply all these, these reliabilities 
to make it invariant under a sum like that. But for that, you need to enumerate all elements of the group generated by this. So this is why we are going to study representation theory of groups. Because we have a group of relabeling uh, of variables. And we have an action of that group. It's going to act on a vector space. And that vector space is the vector space of monomials of that matrix. And now there is something extremely cool. But I need a bit more size, uh, a bit more space for that. Uh, let me check. OK. I will keep the matrix because this is important, and I can remove the stuff about SDPs. I'll just keep this one and raise the rest of this board. So the game that we are going to play is to kill as many variables as possible in this matrix. So let's see. So here we have 1, A0, A1, B0, B1. But so I'm going to fill this matrix, and I'm going to use the permutation that we have seen. And every time I can use a permutation to bring a monomial to something else in the matrix, I know they have to be equal. So A0 and B0, we know that they have to be equal, right? Because we can permute A and B. So check. I replace this by A0 and B0. Um, but we have seen as well that I can replace A0 by minus A0, right? So we know. That actually the expectation value of a0 is equal to minus the like to the expectation value of minus a0, which is that. What's the only value that can satisfy this? Zero. So the cool thing that I have now is that I can replace all these variables in the problem by zeros. It's already a huge simplification. Now the next one in the matrix, it's A0, A1. So what, what can we do? Okay, we know it's equal to B0, B1 by permutation, but we know that uh -huh, if I use the, this one, I know that B1 becomes minus B1, and the A gets permuted. But if I look at this, I have B0 and B1. Only the B1 is going to be affected, the B0 stays the same. This is minus B0, B1, 0 as well. So now I know that not only this one, but also this one are equal to 0. Really a huge simplification. Now we are getting A0, B0. Don't forget that now I'm getting lazy, and I don't put the hats everywhere. Don't, don't think that it, it relates to the operator we have seen right now. I just, just want to make sure of that. A0, B0. Of course, I can permute the parties, but that doesn't give me anything. Um, if I flip A0 and A1, B1 takes a minus sign. So this is equal to A1, B0 by the permutation on the right. But now, can I, now this is not invariant on the flip of AB. This is also A0, B1. But now I know that I can apply again the thing on the right, and I get minus A1, B1. So not that super cool. Why? Because I have one expectation value here. I have the same there. They are all equivalent. And I just have the same with the minus sign. So by symmetry, we have 10 variables. And we now have a problem with just a single variable, which is a huge improvement. OK. This is solved in a microsecond anyway by the computer. But when you go from 10,000 to uh, 100, uh, you go, let's say, from an hour or a day to 
10 seconds. So that's that's appreciable. But no, it's not it's not the end. Um, and for that, I need to be, I need to do a bit of representation theory. But just what I want to say is that it only finds symmetries in your in your objective function, and just applying those rules to see which one are equal to each other, you don't lose anything. Like you, you can only improve the quality of your uh, formulation, and it's kind of very easy to make. The second step, moving to representation theory, uh, it's a bit harder. It's maybe easier to make mistakes. We are we are on most problem. We gain like a, a few order of magnitude by simplifying variables. And then we get an order of magnitude of computational time or speed up by doing the, 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 the representation theory part. But I'm going to say no, it's not at all necessary. I will need some space. I will erase what's on the board over there um, and check the time. Yeah. Uh, so you said, like, what is the complexity advantage? Like, if you go to n, if you have n variables, then. Okay. Uh, let me see if I recall that correctly. If n is the size of the, like x, which is n by n, and m is the number of variables. I have that in, in, in one of the papers, like the SIMD poly paper has the expression, but on top of my head, uh, n is basically, to, to test if a matrix is uh, a DP, you need to do eigenvalue decomposition. Uh, so that gives you a factor n cube, but you have, have also something like m square n for uh, the influence of the like to find a good direction for the for the to, or to optimize the expectation values. In practice, uh, the problem that we have m is often much larger than n. I mean, if you look at this expression, you think, oh, um, I should optimize this before. Uh, so that's this. By the way, this is the CPU complexity, the space complexity. I think it's n square and m square, um, but I'm not sure. Uh, so, so this is a factor that has bad scaling, but m is much bigger. So if you if you do improvement on m, you gain a lot over there. Like the constant factor matter a lot. Uh, and once you have done that, then of course you have this. The problem was more that because we had this restriction on m that we use too much memory, we could not increase n to a size that was problematic. Like eigenvalue decomposition is really fast for like matrices of 500, 500, or 1,000 by 1,000. But think of it, if I have my matrix of 500, I would generate a lot of unique monomials inside the matrix. Something like of, of the other, maybe not exactly the square, but it's close. Uh, so M was like the dominant thing. But now that we are known to handle that really well, we are pushing the method. Now we get like matrices of size 5,000 by 5,000. And this starts to be like, like here you really see that it's cubic, so you, you, you get slower as well as this. So now, look, so, yeah? Sorry, so when you went down to 10 variables to 1 variable, yeah. just m, so, not n. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you always go down to 1 variable? No, no, no. Yeah, one variable is like the, CHSA yeah. has a lot of symmetries, yeah. and we use level 1. Yeah, so what's in the general case? Oh, in the general case, what's going to happen? That's to, to be more and more precise on those optimization problems, basically to bring this down, you will increase the level. Okay. So you will increase the degree of the monomials. So, so M and N are going to grow a lot, but the symmetry group doesn't grow. Okay. So, so that's one, one big difference between symmetrization in other areas of physics. Um, often when you symmetrize, like whatever the dimension, then you have something constant size. Here, if you increase the level, you're going to still get like exponential slowdown. Like symmetry gives you a few order of magnitude, like you can do maybe one or two steps more, right. but you still get this block. Um, so mo most of the time you, you get, uh, you divide maybe, you divide roughly the number of variables by the order of the group. Okay. CHSH has order 16, so it's kind of like 10 goes to one, it's compatible, okay. more or less. Um, but symmetries, they will help a lot if you have a problem where what you increase is not the level, let's say your problem is really easily solved at level one or two, but now you increase the number of inputs, or you have the, the number of parties, and like, let's say everything is symmetric on the permutation of parties, then you win because uh, the, the size of your group goes with the, the problem size. Um, but I have like 10 minutes to give you an intro to representation theory. It will be like really short, but showing you this symmetrization was more important. 
Mm. If, I, if I say Shor's, Shor's lemma, anybody in the room knows what Shor's lemma is? Good, because then we all start from the same place. What I will do is just show you an example just with the, um, like the permutation of, of party symmetry. So we have now a, a vec the vector space is indexed by A and B in this way. And we mark something when I apply a row, I apply this permutation of AB. I will permute those two variables, I will permute those two variables, and this one stays uh, alone. What happens is that this space is R5. But I can do a change of basis. And this change of basis is, so now I'm being sloppy because I only have 10 minutes. Later this afternoon, I will show you how to use RepLab. And RepLab is a software that gives you exactly what, I, what I'm doing here for whatever group. So you can play with it and you get like the correct answer. But it's more about the idea. So if I do a change of basis of that space to this one, I'm going to put a0 plus b0, some normalization, a1 plus b1, some normalization, a0 minus b0, some normalization, uh, a1 minus b1, some normalization. Now, what's the action of permuting a and b? This stays the same, this stays the same, this stays the same, this takes a phase of minus one, basically a, a sign flip, and this one takes a sign flip. Um, what this, this group, so it's a group with those just two elements, like do nothing and, and permute, what this group does is it, it acts on the vector space, but now in kind of the, a, a way that's split. Instead of moving things around, I now have a block here that's invariant. And I have an, another block that's the, the vector space is invariant. But actually, each vector inside the vector space, uh, there is a sign flip. So what we obtain is that we have the space R5, and that space splits into R3, this direction R2. So the mathematicians are often very frustrating for physicists. Say, oh, your representation R5, so what it means representation, I have a vector space, and my group transform linearly that vector space in a way that's compatible with the group composition. I'll give you like the axioms this, this afternoon of, of that. Um, mathematician will say, oh, your vector split split into uh, something that's called the trivial representation. Trivial means everything stays completely invariant. And then something called the sign representation means you take a sign flip. But when they write this, they don't tell you what's the basis. For, for particle physicists, it's enough sometimes because if you know on some representation of a group what are the sub representations of SU, blah, 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 you are inside, it's enough to do computations. But for us, we have an explicit matrix to transform. So we, know, we need to know how we combine the original elements here in, in this new basis. So that first, made, first, first certainly to oh, no end. Like I would look into books and they said, oh, to know the irreducible representation that appeared, just today, I look at the character table of a group. So first of all, I don't know what's the group on the right. Second one, I, I don't know how to compute this character table. And then if I know like how many of those things I have inside, this doesn't give me how to change the basis. So what RepLab is doing, basically, you give a group and its representation. We do that this afternoon. And it gives you that matrix U, such that you do the change of basis on your matrix and you, you simplify it. Um, so now here for that uh, particular case, that matrix would be something, uh, the vector would be one, and then I would have zero, one over square root of two, zero, one over square root of two, zero, zero, um, one over square root of two, zero, one over square root of two, zero. Oh no, wait a minute, I'm confused. Uh, 0, 0, 1 over square root of 2, 0, 1 over square root of 2, and now 0 minus 1 over square root of 2, 0, no plus and minus here, 0, 0, 1 over square root of 2, 0, minus 1 over square root of 2. So now the thing is, if you look at this matrix, what in that new subspace, what you will obtain, just checking that we don't go over time, 
even if I'm a bit unwavy, I prefer to not go over time in much more time later. We now have, in the new basis, a block that's not going to change sign, this is the trivial, and uh, another block uh, of size two that's going to take a sign. So if I did the transformation of, okay, not this matrix actually, this one that has the symmetry property. What's going to happen is that I have four blocks now. And this block, I have the trivial and the trivial, so there is no change under the group. Now the block here, it's trivial and sign, it's sign and trivial, and this one is sign and sign. Like what happens to it? This is not really good mathematical notation, just what happens with this sign stuff. So this, if I permute the, uh, the A and the B both, this is going to, 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 to change like minus one. So what it means is that if I have the original matrix and now I, I, I take um, the, the, what's, what happens with this permutation, I'm going to get that this block here, that I'm going to call x row one column two, like one, two, I get that this block x one, two is equal to x minus, uh, minus x one, two. So this is equal to zero. And again, this one here takes a sign, so I also have that x21, this block is equal to minus x21, that block has to be equal to zero. And now this block takes the sign twice by the action on the rows and the columns, so the both things are going to cancel, and this is non-zero. So it means that this matrix, which is five by five, I can reduce it to a block that's three by three plus a block that's two by two, two by two. And the, this process is called, so that was like the first thing that we did. The second one is called block diagonalization using the decomposition of representations. And RepLab automates that completely. The, there is a catch, like it's a very hard problem. So RepLab is, is approximating it. And nobody has done that before, so it's funny, like the theories in some papers so first time I see, uh, like, it's like uh, somebody must have written a package. Oh, no, nobody did, so I, I wrote one. So the trick is that you're not going to get this, this matrix analytically. Sometimes RepLab is clever enough to recover uh, an algebraic solution, but most of the time it will not. What you get instead is something really, really close to U. So you basically get that's U, that's basically U plus some epsilon matrix, something really small. But when you do numerates, if the, you know, like if you change the basis like 10 to the minus 16, it's not going to change the, the, the way your SDP is going to be solved. It's part of the numerical noise. And sometimes, because you have much smaller blocks, you actually get something more precise, because whatever you lose here is, not, is actually helping the solver in other ways, so you get uh, a bit of improved precision. Still, I want to say, don't trust like well, what it's doing blindly. Um, you can. When we'll do the exercise later, uh, you, you'll see how it works. And, and, and later, you can actually check that after block diagonalization, those blocks should be like really, really, really small. Or you can look at what the solution and try to guess what's the analytical answer. You can you know, do all of that. Um, and that, that's quite cool. What? Yeah. Yeah, always that there's a possible side of symmetric No, no. So that, that's kind of like the, you know, the, the Cliff's not version of our presentation theory. Uh, what I've used is a very simple group. It's, that it's S2, only a permutation of two elements. And um, for S2, you only have two representations that are like trivial, nothing, and, and the sign. Depending on the group, you will have like more and more. So what's going to happen is that you split your space R, uh, what is this, M for the size of the matrix. It's going to split into N1, N2, blah, 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 N3, and so on. So already those things define blocks. So that's going to be a first split that WebLab is doing. And inside each blocks, you get a second split, uh, big N, and it corresponds to two things. So I spoke here that I have a, a vector space. And I looked that inside that vector space, I had invariant subspaces. And they are sub, what we call sub-representations. What you can do uh, when you have a group action, you can split 
more and more, you look like inside the new environment subspace, do we have other things that are invariant? And actually, yes, like Hina said, that, that whole thing is invariant, but actually it splits in this way, and here it splits in this way. So I have like actually one plus one plus one plus one plus one. So you, you continue the split, you continue the split, you continue the split. And then the thing that you're going to do is to see which of those no irreducible representation that I cannot split further. No, wait a minute, there's a terminology problem. I say irreducible representation. It's more like spaces where those representations uh, live. You're going to see, okay, which one move under the group action in the same way? Like these three, they move, they don't move at all. Those two, they take the assigned change. And you group them, and the number of copies in each of the groups give you the size of the final blocks. Uh, you will see in the lab that when you, you, you type a group, you ask your lab to decompose, it tells you the number of uh, inequivalent representation and inside each block, how many copies. And from that, you deduce the size of your SDK. I don't know if they, yeah? Uh, sorry. Uh, your lab, how old is it like, like practically speaking? Like how big of that's a good question. So, so, so the short answer is that right now it needs to do a full eigenvalue decomposition. So it will be as expensive as one step of the SDP. So if you have so a SDP that I got 5,000 by 5,000, maybe the second value decomposition takes 10 minutes. But the SDP will do 20 steps. So that will be tw at least 20 times 20, 20 minutes. But RepLab only needs to do that once. Or maybe twice. Um, I want to say, right now I want the code to be super robust. It's not optimized. We are introducing uh, optimization along the way. The goal is like just the cost of one eigenvalue decomposition. The group size, it's not a big deal. Um, that part is not super optimized. But what you do is order of log of the order of the group, more or less, like the, the number of operations. And, and later, we, we do something that's, that's a bit more optimized. But as I said, my goal is more of something, of something that doesn't break on your computer than something that's just a prototype and, and works as fast as possible. I think we are like nearing like lunchtime. I don't know if there are like, so just a last question. Otherwise, I'll take them during the lab later. Otherwise, yeah, thanks for your attention. It was a cool session. Oh, sorry, I forgot the chocolates. So I'll, I'll bring it to the lab, and I, uh, like I will have more time to.